Good morning, friends. Here in the sanctuary or across the universe by the gift of YouTube, we gather this day in worship on the eve of a new year with uh, wonder and hope and joy in our hearts. Our call to worship comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, who uh, spoke of uh, gratitude and appreciation for the, the gifts of salvation that had come to God's people in his day and time. Uh, we will share those now responsively as our call to worship. I would invite those who are comfortable doing so to stand as we share those together. Let us rejoice in the Lord. God has clothed us in garments of salvation. Our hymn is Angels from the Realms of Glory as we lift our voices here or at home. The verses are printed in your programs or appearing on the screen in front of you. be seated. The birth of Jesus communicates that God is entirely committed to the well-being of all God's creation, including humanity. God shares our human form so that we may have confidence in God's presence with us. We can speak openly to God and trust in God's ability to help us. We join now in a prayer of confession and renewal, followed by a time of silent prayer. Eternal God, by the birth of Jesus Christ, you gave yourself to the world. Grant that, being born in our hearts, he may save us from all our misdirected ways and restore within us the image and likeness of our Creator. To you be everlasting praise and glory. Amen. The grace of God brings salvation to all. We are free to live in steadfast faithfulness. Amen.
us welcome one another now in the grace and peace of the Christ child. I want to welcome you all to worship as we share together in celebration and praise on this first Sunday in the season of Christmas. Those worshiping together for the first time, welcome to you. As we can be helpful, we look forward to doing so, and we are glad that we may worship God together this day. If you would uh, take a moment and share with us your names in the welcome pads there on the back of the pew in front of you and share those with your neighbors down the road, that would be much appreciated. Uh, as you're doing that, a couple of things to share. What a week that was. Um, and, and it all took place on one day. Um, the amazing, uh, rich, full to overflowing character of our worship on uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve uh, together. Um, among the five services that day, there were uh, over a thousand people in worship, and, um, and you were among them. And thank you so much for your uh, spirit of generosity and hope as we uh, celebrated together. Uh, it is still Christmas, um, a season of 12 days that actually begins on December 25th, and though many people are tired of Christmas by December 26th, um, having lived in it for weeks up to that time, um, in fact, we are just really uh, a little ways in. Um, if you are giving gifts to your true love today, um, you want to be sure to have lined up your seven swans of swimming. Uh, and if you've not uh, already discovered this, according to uh, PNC Waterhouse, who keeps an annual um, uh, tally of the cost of the gifts from the 12 days of Christmas, um, assuming that there's one of each, not that every time we sing the song, we sing them over again. And so just one set all the way through. A, a little over, um, well, $46,000, 729 uh, and 86 cents, which is just 2.7% uh, more than last year. Um, last year, it went up 15.4% uh, inflation, you know, and this year's increase is due mostly to the cost of the birds, of which there are many. Uh, turtle doves were up 25%, followed by partridges at 13.9%, uh, geese allaying 8.3%. Swans were surprisingly stable at 0%, uh, along with calling birds, gold rings, maids of milking, and ladies dancing all of which showed no increase over last year. And if this discussion of inflation has in any way uh, affected your blood pressure, good news for you. Today is a Sunday on which that can be checked in our church office. Uh, Susan Marquis will be glad to meet you there and offer insight and uh, encouragement around that or other health-related concerns you may have. Um, we will be taking the greens down here in the sanctuary next week, not today. And among the reasons for that are that um, with the transition to um, uh, artificial greenery here in the sanctuary, we can leave them up longer without fear of burning the church down. So um, that is a, a, a gift to us. Uh, today is also the last day for making contributions in 2023, either gifts given in hand or postmarked yesterday uh, can be counted for this year. Uh, after that, your gifts will still be greatly appreciated as they always are, uh, and they will count towards our work in 2024. Uh, Happy New Year to you all, by the way, as we stand at the verge of uh, this exciting um, new day. And speaking of beginnings, this morning we get to participate in the celebration of God's love and God's grace in the sacrament of baptism. And so at this time, I would invite the Gromsky family to come forward with, with Walter. 
and to join April and me at the font. come around here so that the congregation can see and help to welcome him. In baptism, we celebrate God's love, a love revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, a love which has surrounded this child from the beginning. In baptism, we proclaim that God has acted to save us. God washes us in cleansing waters and adopts us as members of the household and family of faith. In baptism, we dedicate our children to Christ's purposes, knowing that even though we may falter, God will not, but will continue through the Holy Spirit, the work begun this day, a work in which life triumphs over death. I ask, therefore, do you present this child, earnestly desiring that by holy baptism, he be made a member of the Church of Christ. I do. These next questions I will ask uh, Jason and Anna on behalf of their son. Desiring the freedom of new life in Christ, do you turn away from evil and renounce its power? I do. I do. do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior and Lord? I do. I do. Will you bring up your child in the knowledge and love of God that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace, profess his faith, and lead a Christian life. Let us pray. Blessed are you, our God, maker of heaven and earth. By the gift of water, you nourish and sustain us and all living things. At the beginning, your spirit was at work, brooding over the waters of creation's birth and bringing forth life in all its fullness. Over and over again, you have shown your grace to us as water, cleansing the earth at the flood, leading Israel through the sea into the freedom of the promised land, flowing from the rock in the wilderness. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. He was baptized by John in the River Jordan and anointed by the Holy Spirit. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. Jesus called his followers to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives. May the washing of baptism bind us to your holy fellowship and make us one with you in the Spirit. Amen. And what are the names of this child? Walter G. Son. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wally, receive the cross of Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you may continue as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll take you on a tour. Child of blessing, child of promise,
The words printed in your bulletins, or again appearing on the screen, will help us together to welcome Wally into our church family. Would you please join with me? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround you with a community of love and forgiveness that you may grow in God and be found faithful in your service to others. We will pray for you that you may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. And Wally, this is yours. You get to have that. Huh? And I'm going to give your mother your baptismal certificate, which she can take. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. So glad to be able to be a part of this together. I'm glad to welcome now the children here to the front of the sanctuary. Merry Christmas. This is my daughter, Christina. She's going to be helping me today. The Christmas season is a time for imagining what it might have been like to be one of the very first people to see Jesus when he was born into the world. Here is what one person imagined after reading the Gospel of Luke. On a certain night in wintertime a long time ago, a young shepherd a shepherd boy was up in the hills looking for one of the sheep in his care. The owner of the sheep was very stern, and the boy was afraid to go home without the whole flock being gathered together. The shepherd was looking behind every bush and behind every rock, and somehow gradually, without even realizing it, his path was leading him up to the top of a hill. He got up there and looked down, and there was the town called Bethlehem, and suddenly the heavens opened, and the night became as bright as day. A whole host, which means a lot of angels, appeared, and a song of praise sounded over the earth. Then one of the angels came to stand right in front of the young shepherd and said, Don't worry about your little sheep. All is going to be well, because at this moment a great and wonderful shepherd has been born. Run to Bethlehem where the Christ child, the redeemer of the world, is lying in a manger. The shepherd didn't move. Finally, he said, I don't think it would be right for me to go welcome someone that important without taking a gift. And what could I bring? You may take this flute and play it for the newborn said the angel, and putting the flute in the shepherd's hand, the angel vanished. The flute had seven notes, and when the young shepherd put it to his lips, it played. Grateful and happy, the shepherd set off running down the hill. He came to a stream, and he tried to jump over it without breaking stride, but he tumbled and fell down, and the flute flew out of his hands. And right then he said a word that shepherds sometimes say, that's really not a very nice word. And then he went and he picked up the flute, and he realized one of the notes was missing. Then as he rounded the path, suddenly he was face to face with a wolf. Wolves only go around at nighttime, and the wolf was his enemy because the wolf was also looking for little lambs. But he stood up strong, and he shouted at the wolf, Go away! And then for good measure, 
The shepherd threw the flute at the wolf, and the wolf did turn and run, and that was a relief, but when the shepherd found the flute and picked it up, it had now only five notes. He arrived at the fire ring where sometimes the shepherds would gather together, keep their flocks all herded up in one place, and then they could sit around the fire telling stories and keeping each other company. But although the sheep were there, and for all he knew, his missing sheep was there, but none of the shepherds were there. They left without me, he thought. I bet they went to a tavern in town and they're all sitting around having a party. And it made him feel really left out. And that was kind of a grumpy feeling. So he kicked a jar of water and tipped it over, and somehow the flute slipped right out of his hand. When he picked it up, he'd lost another note. Now there were only four. One of the sheep gathered nearby there was making a loud ruckus, bleeding and bawling and disturbing the rest of the sheep who were trying to rest. So the shepherd tried to sort of push on it with his flute to shove it back into the herd and help it be quiet. But when that effort was finished and the sheep were all quiet, the notes on the flute had been reduced to three. At the gates of Bethlehem, the shepherd got into a fight with a group of boys that was there trying to prevent him from passing through the gates and into the town. And he managed to keep hold of the flute, but when the fighting was over and he was moving through the streets again, he was down to two notes. He passed a house where a dog was barking and he swatted at it with the flute. He wanted it to be quiet and not give his presence away. Finally, finally, he arrived at the stable. And there, a wondrous, amazing star was shining. And he looked and saw the savior of the world lying on, on a bed of straw in a manger. The shepherd boy was afraid to go in with his one-noted flute and ashamed that he had so little left in his gift. But Mary saw him there hovering at the door, and she beckoned him, come on in. So he came forward and played his last and only note. It was strangely beautiful. The baby listened. The animals listened. Mary and Joseph listened. And then the Christ child reached out and touched the flute. With that touch, the flute was made whole again. <coughs> it sounded full and complete and glorious as if it had been made by angels and was being played in heaven. I'm going to say a prayer for us now. Dear God, thank you for your forgiving and healing love. Thank you for making it possible for us to come to you and for blessing us with gifts that we may offer to your service. Amen. I hope you have a good time in Sunday school today.
Before our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession, I'm going to tell another story featuring a child. The story about the little shepherd boy culminated in joy over the receiving of grace and forgiveness. This one features the persistent desire to give. It's about Matteo, who spent weeks and months preparing for the birth of Jesus. In the part of the world where Matteo lived, it was the custom that at Christmas time a great market would be held in the plaza. After the market, every child and every adult would enter into the church for worship, and they would all bring gifts for the holy child. Farmers would bring corn, weavers would bring cloth, potters like Mateo's family might bring a beautiful bowl or a vase. Mateo knew exactly the gift he wanted to bring the baby. During the midsummer market, he had seen a silversmith who had not only jewelry and candlesticks and utensils for sale, but also a perfect silver whistle. It was beautiful. Mateo's plan was this. His father had taught him to make animal-shaped whistles out of clay. He would make and sell as many clay whistles as he possibly could, and then, with the money that he could make as he sold them at the Christmas market, he would then buy the silver whistle. Throughout the fall, Matteo labored at making whistles, shaping them, firing them, and then during the early days of December, he painted the animals with stripes or spots or eyes or manes, whichever would enhance the personality and character and identity of those little clay flutes. And when the day came for the journey to town, Mateo was ready. His bundles were all packed. He picked them up and watched as his parents also were hoisting their ceramic products onto his father's shoulders and strapping his little sister onto their mother's back. The family left home at sunrise. It was a long walk to town. But the farther they went, the more walkers joined them on the road. They exchanged greetings, swapped news, sang songs. When they arrived at the market, they found a place to spread their blanket and display their bowls and cups and jars and pots, and as well, their clay whistles in the shape of animals. Business was good. The day passed quickly. When the sun began to get low in the sky and Matteo had only one whistle left, he asked his father if it would be all right for him to go in search of the silversmith's stall. Go ahead, his father answered. So Matteo 
put that little clay whistle into his pocket along with the money from his sales, and he hurried off into the crowd where he encountered an array of jugglers and dancers, food sellers, and lantern makers. There was so much to see. Matteo almost felt dizzy as he pushed his way through the crowd. All of a sudden, right in front of Matteo was a man with a donkey. You lazy good for nothing, the man was shouting as he picked up a stick and waved it at the little donkey. If I could find someone foolish enough to buy you, believe me, I would certainly make the sale, the man yelled. His face was all red and the stick was raising higher and higher. No, called Matteo, don't hit him, I will buy him. It was not until he had handed over all the coins from his pocket that he remembered the silver whistle. Oh no, Matteo sighed. I wonder if the silversmith would trade this donkey for the silver whistle. As he stood scratching the donkey's ears and wondering what to do, someone approached. What a fine animal, exclaimed a man, almost hidden under the pile of blankets and ponchos he was carrying. How much better would my life be if I had a strong donkey like this one? Will you ex accept this beautiful serape in exchange for that donkey? Matteo admired the weaving and the floral embroidery on the serape he had been offered. Meanwhile, the old man was bent over and whispering in the donkey's ear. I can tell, thought Matteo, this man will be very good to the donkey. He made the trade, and the blanket seller with his new donkey disappeared into the crowd. Well, by now, darkness was falling, and Matteo continued to search for the silversmith, but he could not find anyone who had seen him. Finally, someone suggested that maybe the silversmith had already closed up shop and had gone into the church. Do you know whether he still had the silver whistle? Matteo asked the woman who had made this suggestion. But before she could answer, her little girl started to cry and to cough. The girl was shivering in the cold night air, and Matteo looked closely and saw that the mother and child were wearing little more than rags. Here, he said, handing the mother the fine blanket covered with embroidered flowers before running off to find his own family. Matteo was exhausted and deeply disappointed. He stood quietly next to his mother and father and baby sister with his head hanging down. You could give your last clay whistle, suggested his father when he found out what had happened. The holy child would be pleased, he said. But Matteo was embarrassed about that little clay whistle. It was the first one he had ever made, and it was supposed to be a yellow bird, but it had a funny shape. Its wings did not look quite right. He cradled the whistle with his fingers curled around it as he made his way through the candles and the singing of the procession into church. He actually didn't want anyone to see his gift. As he approached the life-size crush scene, he looked for some place he could hide that ugly yellow bird, maybe tuck it under someone else's present. But then somebody took the little bird out of his hand and placed it right on the edge of the manger. Matteo looked at the baby Jesus and thought he saw a small smile. When he glanced again at the bird, it was glistening like gold in the candlelight. We turn now to God in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for becoming small and vulnerable as you entered the world. Thank you for reminding us in this way of the value of caring and kindness. Thank you for the light that shines around you, teaching us that what we do for others, we do for you. You are the Prince of Peace, and yet you are found in humble circumstances. You are salvation for the earth, and yet you invite ordinary people, people of all different backgrounds, to join you in serving God's holy purposes. Make us faithful, not only today, 
but all the year round. On this day of continuing Christmas joy, we pray your encouragement for all who might feel frail or forgotten, your wisdom for those who feel confused about what to do or where to go, your protection for those who are in danger, your nourishment for those who are hungry, your healing for those who are sick. Surround with your tender mercy our dear ones, including young Min, who is awaiting surgery, Mo, who is in the hospital, Marsha, Bill, and Ron, who dwell in care facilities, Dave, Kent, Andy, Joan, Andy Pinn, Marty, Debbie and Gary, Beth, Wayne, Lynn, and others whose strivings for health are ongoing. Comfort those who are grieving loved ones, including the family of Ron Showalter. Awaken new hope in those who have been in duress. Show your people everywhere how to work together to find solutions to problems and paths forward where much has been lost. At Christmas time, all creation sings. Thank you for teaching us to treasure the plants and animals and all other forms of life which contribute to the beauty of the earth. Lead humankind in our efforts to protect and share clean water and unpolluted air. Show us how war could become peace and violence could be abandoned in favor of compassion. Break through our cynicism and despair so that we may see again with the eyes of a child. Help us take delight in the people and the simple pleasures around us. Grateful for Jesus, whose presence provokes praise among those who have waited long for things to be made right, we lift our voices in saying the prayer that he taught us, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God's generosity with us makes it possible for us to be generous in return. The gifts of the congregation for Christ's ministry in the world are received by means of personally delivered online and mailed in contributions. We dedicate our offerings now with this prayer. Gracious God, as you have given yourself to us, so we give ourselves to you. Make our ministry fruitful that the peaceful and loving power of Jesus may be known in our own neighborhoods and around the world. Amen.
Please be seated. Luke's gospel tells not only of Jesus' birth, but also of how Mary and Joseph raised him within the traditional Jewish religious practices. When the infant Jesus was brought to the temple for the first time, two different elders who spent their days in prayer and worship recognized something special about him. The angels and the shepherds were the first, but not the last to praise God in the presence of Jesus. Luke chapter two, verses 22 to 40, begins on page 71 of the New Testament portion of the Sanctuary Bibles. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolidation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him.
want to thank uh, Deborah Schrader for filling in this morning. Uh, Claire McCurry, who was originally to be our liturgist, uh, had uh, symptoms of a cold late this week, and so uh, Deborah has filled in. I figured that you could all survive the discrepancy between the printed materials and the actual person uh, lead, helping lead us in, in worship. Um, I also was noting, again, as the text was being read, uh, in the scripture for today, we have uh, the view of uh, God's deliverance as seen through the eyes of uh, two persons uh, mature in years, late in their lives, seeing the fulfillment of uh, God's promise in the birth of the child. In the stories that uh, April and I have chosen to share today, um, it is uh, the view through the eyes of a child um, that we still see um, the, the richness and the depth of uh, God's great gift. Um, this particular story that I'll share is one that is uh, close to my uh, heart, and that is because its author, uh, Marina Endicott, is my wife Tira's older sister. And uh, Marina in Canada is a uh, reasonably well-known uh, author, uh, novelist, um, and uh, has, has worked in that uh, realm for many years. The story that I'm reading is the first published work that she had, a short story uh, now many years ago, and, and one of my uh, very favorites. It is called Being Mary. When I was six, my mother grew ill. She and my father sat in the living room in the same attitudes that they sat in for telling us about new babies coming. For a moment when we went in to sit down with them to be told something, I thought it was a baby. But they were sitting very still, and they held our hands, which they wouldn't have bothered doing if it was something good. And the doctor had come to our house in the morning, which he had never done for a baby. My mother said that she had discovered that she was sick, that she had cancer, and that she would have to go away for an operation just before Christmas. This meant very little, really, except that when people had cancer, they died. All my relations who had died, none of whom I had known at all well, had died of cancer. It was like a necessary first step in dying. My father looked quite frightened. He was moving his lips a little, not the internal praying way, but the biting way. He was holding my hand, and he kept pressing it a little and letting it go a little. I could not help thinking about other things while they were talking, and I may have missed something. I was thinking about playing orphans on a raft, which was then and remained for many years our favorite game. On the raft, one of the poor children was always very ill, usually my sister Cece, and one was weak with hunger and went mad later, and one was strong and pulled everyone else through, except for the ill one, who sometimes died and was a ghost for the rest of the game, giving advice. There were obviously important things about playing that game that I was going to have to take seriously soon, as I was the oldest. I would, in real life, have to be the strong one. Although in the game, I sometimes insisted on being the sick one because I liked dying and giving advice. And also, the sick one was usually the one all the others liked best, which was why she was dying, of course. They didn't say anything about dying or about us being orphans. It was, I suppose, a leap for me to think of us as orphans when only my mother was ill, but my mother and father were one thing to me then and my mother was the stronger element in that one thing. They didn't talk about our guardians as they had when they flew in a plane all the way to Montreal without taking us with them. Our guardians were richer than we were and had six children already and ran their house like a boot camp, but the mother was spare and gray and elegant, and I admired her, and I liked her children. The part I almost missed, which I didn't understand for a minute, was that this time we were going with them to Vancouver for the operation. 
They explained that we would stay in different people's houses because there were too many of us for one family, except for our guardians, I suppose, who had so many they wouldn't notice for more. This was fine. It was always interesting to stay in strange houses, but we were leaving at the end of the week. We could not leave at the end of the week because at school I was in a pageant and I was Mary. It would have been inappropriate to say so in the quiet living room. My mother finished telling us about who we would stay with, and my father prayed for a minute, and then we made supper and ate at the pull-down table in the kitchen, which was a treat. I had never been Mary before, even though I was the minister's eldest daughter and surely an ideal candidate. When the school photographer took our pictures, he called me Cupcake, which made me sneer at him. And the picture still sits on my mother's dresser, a girl in a beautiful blue dress with curled hair, sneering in a very pompous way. My baby sister had been Jesus the year before in the church pageant, while I was only an angel, and my brother was the littlest shepherd who got to give his crutch to the baby, but although I knew that the part of Mary was written for me, no one would cast me. Then I went to school and began to get an education and to learn to read, which was my spiritual home. And along came Miss Saddlemeyer and let me be Mary. I also wanted to be Mary because she was truly beautiful and a lovely person and an angel talked to her and then her baby was God and when the angel came and talked to her, which must have been a bit surprising, she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, which I thought was the most beautiful thing anyone had ever said. If I had been a boy, I would perhaps have wanted to be God, but for women in the Bible, there aren't that many parts. Mary Magdalene, I felt I needed more worldly experience for. Things are very unfair, too, and some people have to be Jezebel and Martha and Judas and poor Leah, the unwanted older sister, and I didn't want to fall into that kind of thing in real life, and you could see how easy it would be. It was still inappropriate to say anything about the pageant that night and in the morning. It was clear that I would have to tell my teacher myself that I would be unable to be in the pageant. But when I got to school, it was very busy, and I had to wait until lunchtime. At lunch, Miss Saddlemeyer rushed off to the staff room right away instead of staying to talk to people and leaving slowly, as she usually did. And I went and ate my lunch with Jamie, whose parents were our guardians, just as usual. Only before I went, I passed a desk with an eraser sitting on it, just sitting there. It was a beautiful pink eraser. Not the ordinary kind, but a new kind that smelled wonderful, like candy. I had always wanted to have one of those erasers to bite into it and see what it tasted like. I put out my hand as I passed the desk and picked up the eraser and put it in my pocket. While we had lunch, I told Jamie that I was going away soon, but I didn't say how soon. I told him that my mother was sick, and he was very impressed. His mother never got sick. When she had had her last baby, she did sit-ups the next day and lost all the weight she had gained in three weeks. My mother had once spent three months in bed being quite sick, and it gave me an edge over Jamie beyond the ordinary edge of being a girl and being smarter and being the daughter of the minister. And when we had eaten our sandwiches, Mine was tomato and lettuce, my father's favorite kind, which always got wet during the wait before lunch. I took a bite of the eraser. It tasted dreadful. Even when I was much older, whenever I was conscious of having done something that I ought to have left undone, I got the taste of that eraser in my mouth. It was a terrible cheat to smell so good and taste like that. It also crumbled in my mouth, so it was difficult to get all the little pieces out without Jamie seeing me. I had to go to the bathroom on the way to our room and rinse my mouth out with warm water. When I got back, Darlene was sitting at her desk looking for her eraser. 
She put up her hand when Miss Saddlemeyer came into the room. Miss Saddlemeyer, someone has taken my eraser, she said very loudly. She was an awful girl <laughs> with smooth blonde hair that separated into strands and many different pink sweaters. She was quite pretty, but I didn't like her at all, and I was not sorry that I had bitten into her eraser into two halves and spit out half in crumbs. Only it would be very awkward if she discovered I had taken her eraser because she would make a stink. And underneath that objective thought was the certainty that I would go to prison. And underneath that subjective thought was a devastating knowledge that a person who stole erasers and ate them was unfit to be merry in the play. Miss Saddlemeyer told her to look again for her eraser and began writing on the board. Darlene looked on the top of her desk again, but it was not there, of course, because what remained of it was in my pocket and weighed a lot. Then she turned around to the desk I shared with Jamie behind her and looked straight at me and said quietly, because she didn't want Miss Saddlemeyer to hear her, you stole it. Jamie was appalled and put his fist in her face, which was not the thing to do at school, but Barlene was too mad to tell on him. You stole my eraser, she said again to me, and I know it. There was no possibility of a quick retort. Darlene was smarter than I thought, and probably God had told her who took her eraser. I couldn't think of anything to say at all, not even, no, I didn't. It was a good thing that Jamie was there because he said it for me, and he said it again and again, louder. I was afraid if he kept saying it, Miss Saddlemeyer would hear, and as soon as she looked at me, she too would know that I had taken the eraser. And a little movie would run in her head of me putting out my hand and taking the eraser, and then me in the lunchroom taking a bite of the eraser, and then she would be miserable because she really liked me, and it is not possible to like someone who takes people's erasers and eats them. Darlene was getting pinker, and something had to be done, and done properly, or disaster would be upon me, and I would be known everywhere, no longer as the daughter of the minister, but as the thief. Thief, she said, still fairly quietly. But people around us were beginning to look. I looked up at her and said, I didn't take your eraser. I said it to shut her up forever, to make it impossible for her ever to speak again, to sew her mouth shut, to rob her of the gift of language, and to make her believe me. It was one of the most important things I had ever said, and it was a lie. I put my hand on the eraser in my pocket, and I thought about God and about jail and about Miss Saddlemeyer, and I looked at her as if she was a squashed bug who was a liar and a thief herself. It worked very well. Then I thought about God some more, and I thought about that it would be impossible to believe in God if a person could lie and make people believe so easily when she had her hand on the eraser in her pocket and the taste and smell of it still in her mouth and nose. Darlene sat down in her seat again and looked for her eraser. Jamie looked at me and twirled his finger around his ear and then pointed at her to say, she's crazy. I looked at him and thought, how stupid everyone in the world was. And then I walked up to Miss Saddlemeyer's desk and stood there while she finished writing on the board. If I hadn't taken a bite out of the eraser, I would probably have said something. Or I would at least have slipped it onto the floor so she could find it. But stealing an eraser to eat is difficult to confess to. And you can't give one back casually when it is bitten in half with teeth marks. I thought about telling Miss Saddlemeyer while I waited for her but it seemed to me that it would serve no useful purpose and that I was not going to be merry in the play anyway because I had to go away. And so I wouldn't have to quit from sin, I could quit from absence. I've been unable to live in one place more than two years ever since. Something always comes up that makes it seem better to quit from absence. Miss Saddlemeyer finished writing on the board and came to sit down at her desk and I told her, to tell her that I had to tell her something. And she said, can you tell me later? I have something important to tell everyone in the class. 
I would probably have rushed ahead with it anyway, except for having stolen the eraser. I couldn't really bear to be in Miss Saddlemeyer's presence having done such a thing, because she was the queen of the world to me. So I went back to my desk and sat down beside Jamie again. Darlene was still poking through her desk for her eraser. Miss Saddlemeyer stood in front of her desk and looked at everyone, and she said, Would some of you please come out into the hall with me? Put your heads down on your desks. It's a secret. And she walked down the aisles and patted people on the head to tell them to come with her. She patted about ten people, I guess, and they went out into the hall, and they were gone for a few minutes. And then they came back and sat down again, and she patted other heads and went out into the hall again. And she did that several times, but she never patted me on the head. Jamie was one of the first people who went out into the hall. When he came back, he looked at me before he put his head on his desk. I knew he looked at me, but I didn't look up quickly enough to see how he was looking. Darlene went in the third or fourth batch. Finally, Miss Saddlemeyer brought the last batch into the room and said, is there anyone I haven't picked? I was about to cry, even though I hadn't cried about my mother being very ill or about being so bad that I could steal an eraser and then lie so well that everyone believed me. I put my hand up. Oh, said Miss Saddlemeyer, of course, come with me and I will tell you. She took me into the hallway all by myself and she put her arms around me and she said, we heard that you were going away. Then I did cry and I said, I can't be merry in the play. She sat down on the floor and pulled me down beside her and told me that there was going to be a party for me going away at school on Thursday. She said we would play games and sing and she would bring her guitar and there would be things to eat and that we would do the pageant for the class then, which would be good practice for the other people and a chance for me to do it once before somebody else was merry. I knew what she was going to say just before she said it, which I often did. She said, maybe you could help me think of who could be Mary instead. I also knew what she thought I would say. There was a girl in our class who was too big for her age called Karen, who nobody liked very much, not for any reason. Miss Saddlemeyer made it clear that she liked Karen and that anyone who was mean to her was going to have to explain themselves well. I understood this and also that Karen was actually quite nice. Miss Saddlemeyer wanted me to say Karen, who was not in the play at all, because she had a broken ankle and couldn't walk much when it was cast, but now she was better and she would be able to do it. However, if you are going to steal erasers and not give them back because they are bitten, and then not say anything about having done it, and not explain that you should not be merry because you are not up to it morally, then you have to have your own set of morals. And although I hated Darlene like poison just at that moment, Darlene was not in the play either. Because Miss Saddlemeyer did not like her very much, although she didn't show that except by being a little bit nicer and slower with her, Darlene's eraser had been taken and eaten by me, and she would have to be merry. It was not entirely Darlene's fault that she was so awful. She had an awful mother. Maybe being Mary would be better for her than for Karen, who Miss Saddlemeyer already liked. And if Miss Saddlemeyer knew as soon as I said her name that I had stolen Darlene's eraser, then she would have to know. Darlene, I said to her, still sitting on the floor with her arms around me, I think Darlene should be Mary now. She was quite surprised. She just sat there for a minute, and then she tightened her arm around me and looked at me, and then she said, okay, Darlene it is. You don't have to worry, you know. She was talking about the eraser. After school, I walked home with Jamie until we went different ways, and then I carried on by myself. I didn't walk to walk the usual way. I thought I would have an adventure and walk through other streets. Darlene had been very surprised, too, when Miss Saddlemeyer asked her if she would be merry when I was away. Miss Saddlemeyer was a very good woman and did not say, Laura thinks you should be merry. She must also, I think, have been quite a moral woman if she could understand what I was doing, and a generous and intelligent one, to say to me only that I didn't have to worry. 
There was a lot of snow. It was dark, too, at four o'clock. Not deep night dark, but evening. I walked along the sidewalk of a street one over from where I usually walked. The sidewalks are little valleys when the snow is that high, and it piles on the roadside and on the house side, and you can't see much but snow with little yellow pea patches on it from dogs and holes punched in the bank sometimes from someone trying to climb over and get to the street. At one corner, though, the snow was cleared away well, and across the street you could see the houses right down to the foundations. One of the houses was burning. There must have been noise of fire trucks before I saw the house, but I don't remember it, only coming out of the snow valley into the black street with a house on fire. People were standing around it, back a little from the flames, watching the house gradually blacken and smoke pour up into the sky. When you are quite young, six I was, you know things are important before you learn about symbols. It was a terrifying thing, this fire gulping up the house, waving its arms around and flailing at the beams, but also clean and wintry and beautiful. I stood and watched it. Nobody saw me standing there to tell me to go away. I was ashamed of taking Darlene's eraser, but was not, after all, the crime of the world. I threw the eraser into the fire. It was a good throw and went right into the heart of a window burst open. I was not going to be Mary, but I would be careful not to be Leah or Martha either. Perhaps I would wait a while and be Mary Magdalene. My mother was not going to die, not with a fire like this going on, not when she was so busy, not when her eldest daughter didn't know everything she needed to know. I thought with a small regret of the orphans on the raft, being self-sufficient and strong, and making their own way in the world. Then I turned around and ran home through the snow, in the wind, with the fire behind me. Our hymn invites us to share in announcing good news to the world, the birth of Christ, that we are to shout from the mountain. Let us stand and sing together, go tell it on the mountain. The words are printed in your programs, appearing on your screen, or found in the hymnal number 251. benediction this day comes from the scripture read by Deborah just a little while ago, uh, the words of Simeon as he greets the child that has been presented to him just then. 
Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Amen. <laughs> 